Hundreds of thousands of Muslim Rohingya have been forced from their homes in Myanmar. Aragon Rohingya, Salvation Army, EISA. Do you think that Aung San Suu Kyi's reputation is tainted? The military crackdown has been condemned for its brutality around the world. An iceberg of misinformation. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. Myanmar and the Rohingya Muslims, ethnic cleansing or fake news, depending on who you believe. The racially charged campaign in South Africa that left a PR company with a PR problem, even it can't spin. Northern Sinai in Egypt, where the only way to cover the conflict is the way the CC government tells you to. And this is as bad as it will get. Right? blowing in the wind. Hurricane coverage from the U.S. and the reporters who are a bit too close to the story. The number of Rohingya Muslims forced from their homes in Myanmar is now approaching 400,000. The U.N. says it looks like a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. And the country's de facto leader, a former winner of the Nobel Peace Prize and darling of the international news media, is being seen in an entirely new light. Aung San Suu Kyi and her government are on the defensive. Su Chi has taken to talking about fake news and a huge iceberg of misinformation. The demonization of the Rohingya goes way back in Myanmar. The country is almost 90% Buddhist, and many there see the Rohingya as interlopers from Bangladesh. And while the relatively recent opening of Myanmar's media and internet space has empowered some new voices, it's also provided Buddhist nationalists with some new platforms to dispense fear and hatred of Muslims. As for Aung San Suu Kyi, her refusal to condemn the violence is a troubling angle for many Western journalists to cover, given the way they have venerated her in the past. Our starting point this week is the Myanmar-Bangladesh border. Desperate last dash to sanctuary. The operation targeting what it considers a terrorist organization. Aung San Suu Kyi once fated as the woman who could do no wrong. Now she's been cast as the bad guy. Starting with what this story is not. It is not just about Aung San Suu Kyi. But do you think that now and forevermore uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's reputation is tainted? It is primarily about the Myanmar military the flames and bullets it is used to dispossess Rohingyas, chase them from the country. And it's about a government information campaign that reeks of propaganda. What's been interesting about this narrative is that the civilian government and the military seem to be speaking from the same script. The government has been using terminology like extremist, terrorist, separatist. To make sure that terrorism is not allowed to take root on our soil or on the soil. What that does, it appears to create this kind of um, hysteria, which many in, in, in Myanmar appear to be listening to, and which is fueling support for the military here. A huge amount of the media focus has been on Aung San Suu Kyi, and, and almost all of it has been condemnatory. And you know, as someone who's been campaigning for her and her release for 20 years, you know, I'm incredibly disappointed. But she's not the one carrying out the ethnic cleansing. It's Min Aung Hlaia, the head of the military. He's not even being referred to in any of this um, media coverage. The Myanmar constitution limits the power of its civilian government. Aung San Suu Kyi and her ministers do not have authority over the military, which surrendered absolute power less than three years ago, after more than half a century of military rule. But Suu Kyi does have the power to criticize, and she has not criticized the forced eviction of hundreds of thousands of Muslim Rohingyas, up to 80% of whom, according to UNICEF, are women and children. She has neither criticized nor condemned the burning to the ground of villages Rohingyas have called home for centuries. She has neither criticized, condemned, or even publicly questioned the role of the military in what the UN says appears to be a textbook case of ethnic cleansing. What Suu Kyi and her government have criticized are the messengers, the international news media and UN workers documenting the story, dismissing their reports as fake news, and in one case, fake rape. Dismissal and denial of well-documented accusations and allegations and evidence is part of genocide. Genocide is not just simply like a pulling triggers and burning down houses and driving people out. Genocide involves denial. And for her, as a woman, as a Nobel Peace Prize winner, dismissing the reports of hundreds of women who have been wronged and violated 
and, and Suu Kyi dismissing them as like fake news, you know, fake rape. That was what you read on Aung San Suu Kyi's official Facebook page, fake rape. And that's happening in a climate where the government has consistently been whipping up tensions using social media. Aung San Suu Kyi's information committee has been posting images of bodies hacked to pieces, of what it's alleging are weapons captured from the armed Rohingya organization ASA. Um, you know, it's a constant barrage that they're putting out every day. About the Myanmar authorities and misinformation campaigns, they're not very good at them. If you're going to hand out still images to journalists as proof that Rohingyas are using machetes on their own people and setting their own villages alight, make sure that the woman you describe as Muslim is wearing a real headscarf, as opposed to what looks like a tablecloth. And make sure that when you then take those reporters to a refugee camp full of Hindus, that that same woman is not there, uncovered, or at least suggest a change of clothing. And when taking the media on tour, make sure you keep those journalists corralled so they can't break away from the group and find another village in flames, with Buddhists there admitting they are responsible and that they are working at the behest of the police. They've only just been lit. In fact, we bumped into the people who almost certainly lit them, carrying machetes, not wanting to talk. Though one did admit, yes, they'd set these buildings alight. The government says this is an example of us giving media freedom in this area, but it's simply not the case. You go where they want you to go to, you're followed everywhere you go by security forces, so people are too scared to really say what's happening. So the trips are useful in getting some grasp of what's going on the ground, but they're certainly not a true reflection of what's happening on the ground. The state is feeding the domestic news media the same narrative, and it's being reinforced online. Social media was slow in coming to Myanmar, it's now booming, providing new platforms for figures such as Buddhist monk Ashin Wiratu. When he goes on Facebook and calls Rohingya snakes and mad dogs, he has more than 400,000 followers who can spread that across other platforms. Back in the days of military rule, journalists from Myanmar fought hard for their freedoms. Some set up news outlets in exile. DVB, the democratic voice of Burma, beamed news into Myanmar from Norway. A news magazine called Irrawaddy based itself just across the border in Thailand, pushing a pro-democracy agenda. The magazine now operates out of Yangon, and on this story, like most of the domestic news media, has adopted the government's position. It refuses to call Rohingyas citizens of Myanmar. It calls them Bengalis instead. Irrawaddy's cartoonists depict Rohingyas as dark-skinned people cutting into the queue and suggest Bangladeshis are waiting at the western edge of the country, poised to invade. The magazine's editor, Ung Zhao, was interviewed on CNN earlier this month. His line on the Rohingyas is in perfect harmony with the states. Rohingya is not ethnic minority belongs to Burma. To present the 2014 International Press Freedom Award to Aung Zhao. Back in 2014, Zhao and his magazine were lauded by the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists for coverage of Myanmar that the CPJ called authoritative and independent. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. The most painful uh, thing about the ERAUD is it's run by ex-political prisoners and longtime dissidents. These are guys who have been driven out of the country into exile by the military. Now, ex-freedom fighters joining hands with their former tormentors to portray the Rohingyas yeah, as a terrorist. It's incredibly disappointing to see this. The media that operated in Burma under the dictatorship, they've been very bad on this issue. But the media organizations that were based in exile were much more professional, were much more balanced in their reporting. But now if you see even some of them are towing the government line, you know, it's very worrying for the whole future of press freedom and where people in Burma get their information. That is the media landscape against which the Rohingya refugee story is unfolding. Icebergs of misinformation from both sides on multiple platforms. Civilian leaders now reading from the same script as the generals who once locked them up. Journalists, award winners, 
now backing the same military that sent them into exile. Ugly caricatures, imaginary enemies at the gates. Fake headscarves, fake news, and a fallen icon at the official, irreconcilable end of a media love affair. Other media stories that are on our radar this week. The murder of a journalist in India and some of the online habits of the Prime Minister there have led to the birth of a new hashtag, Block Narendra Modi, and it's trending. Thousands of Indians took to the streets of Bangalore to protest the killing of Gauri Lankesh, who was shot dead on her doorstep. Lankesh was one of the very few female newspaper publishers in India. She was known for her reporting on Hindu nationalism and right-wing extremists. Her murder left some nationalist journalists unmoved. One of their tweets, since deleted, said in Hindi that Lankesh has died a dog's death, and now all the pups are whining with one voice. Another Twitter user wrote, you reap what you sow. Prime Minister Modi, who ran on a nationalist platform, follows both those Twitter accounts. His failure in the wake of those comments to unfollow them is what led to the rise of the Block Modi hashtag. The Paris-based NGO, Reporters Without Borders, has condemned Lankesh's murder, saying it has deprived the media of a tough and determined champion and has deprived India of a voice that was fundamental for the country's democratic life. Bell Pottinger, one of the most controversial names in the public relations business, a company that has spun stories in countless news outlets, has gone out of business. The London-based firm has shut down following a report published last week on a story that the Listening Post featured just over two months ago, that Bell Pottinger was behind a racially charged PR campaign in South Africa. Its South African client was Oak Bay Investments, a company belonging to the influential Gupta family, until recently the owners of a news channel, ANN7, and the New Age newspaper. Defending the Guptas from those who said that the family was profiting from its close relationship with President Jacob Zuma, Bell Pottinger helped popularize a term used to discredit critics of the president and the family, white monopoly capital, essentially playing the race card against its clients' opponents. Bell Pottinger had a long list of controversial clients on its corporate CV, including Oscar Pistorius, the former Paralympics champion convicted of murder, Syrian First Lady Asma al-Assad, and the late Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet. The American network Fox News is making more changes to its evening lineup necessitated by another high-profile anchor losing his job under scandalous circumstances. Eric Bowling is now out one month after the Huffington Post broke a story alleging Bowling had texted unsolicited images of a sexual nature to at least three of his female colleagues. He denies those allegations, but Fox said it has parted ways with him nonetheless. This is the Fox News specialist. Bowling was the co-host of a program that aired at 5 p.m., a show created after the departure of the network's biggest ratings draw, Bill O'Reilly, following a slew of sexual harassment allegations and multi-million dollar payouts to his accusers. Among the new hires on the way, conservative political commentator Laura Ingram, already well known to Fox viewers, is reported to be getting her own show in the 10 p.m. slot. While Bowling and O'Reilly were initially suspended but never returned, another Fox anchor accused of sexual harassment has managed to save his job. As many of you know, I've been on leave for the past couple of months. This Charles Payne of the Fox Business Network was apparently cleared after a two-month-long investigation and is now back on the air. We're going to take a second look now at a story that you don't hear much about because it's unfolding in a place that by government design has become a black hole for news. This past week, at least 18 policemen were killed there in the latest attack carried out by an ISIL affiliate. And the area has been under an almost constant state of emergency since 2014. It's northern Sinai in Egypt, and the fighting there is a major headache for President Sisi. Sisi has sold himself at home and abroad as the only possible guarantor of the country's security and stability. His government, which has already put dozens of journalists in jail, has placed a lid on independent reporting in Sinai. Journalism that deviates from official accounts has been criminalized under an anti-terror law. The official government-backed narrative says that the Army's operations in Sinai are successful, just, even heroic. However, as the attacks this past week suggest, that narrative doesn't always square with reality. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafi now on the insurgency that's been getting the silent treatment and the stories that are going untold in Sinai.
It's not that Egyptians don't hear about what is happening in northern Sinai, it's just that most of the time what they hear sounds something like this. Mm. The government in Cairo wants Egyptians and the international community to believe it has the insurgency in Sinai completely under control, that it's winning the war and winning over the people. It's a carefully crafted narrative that, without independent scrutiny, is near impossible to verify. Whenever you have a war uh, going on like this, you tend to have restrictions on the media. Media access is closely controlled. But it's not just journalists. I mean, there's no independent or potentially critical perspective kind of allowed into Sinai. Or in the case of people who already live there, you know, their views, their testimonies, their uh, accounts are not allowed out of Sinai. The only source of information is the regime itself. And considering that the insurgency is basically getting worse and the regime is not able to control it, every security blunder is undermining the legitimacy of the uh, regime itself. There's two parts to the Egyptian narrative, and, and one part of it may be true, the other part is pure spin. And the bit that's true is that there is an insurgency in northern Sinai. We know the area is awash with smuggled weapons from other countries, um, and we know that there's a degree of this sort of lawlessness there. The bit that's spin and the bit that has been swallowed wholesale by much of the Egyptian population, and quite honestly the international community, is that Egypt is winning this war, uh, and that it is completely a sound strategy for Egypt to fight terror with terror. In April this year, a video surfaced that shattered the government-managed media narrative and renewed allegations of torture, forced disappearances and killings at the hands of the Egyptian army. It appeared to show a group of government-backed militiamen executing two captives. Researchers and activists recognised at least two of the civilians in the video. Back in November 2016, images and videos of their deaths were circulated online by government and pro-government groups. The men were the same, but there was a very different narrative about how they'd been killed. The military spokesperson described the men as terrorists that were killed during an anti-terror operation in northern Sinai. But the leaked video clearly shows that at least two of the men are unarmed at the time. Our analysis indicates that the, the arms were later planted next to their bodies to make it look like there was an exchange of fire. <laughs> So the contradiction between the two accounts raises a lot of questions about, first of all, the credibility of the reports that comes from the government and also the accuracy of the kind of other information that we get from the statements that are propagated or produced by the military spokesmen and official accounts. The government has chosen to remain silent about the execution video. Many Egyptian media outlets did not. The source of the leaked video, Mekemmelin, is an Istanbul-based opposition channel that is affiliated with the outlawed political group, the Muslim Brotherhood. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have produced detailed accounts that aim to verify the footage. But many Egyptian outlets accused Mekemmelin of not just faking the video, but of collaborating with foreign players, including Qatar and Al Jazeera, to produce and publicize it. The Egyptian media is heavily dominated by regime-affiliated newspapers and uh, channels. And they have been pushing the narrative of the conspiracy theory since late 2012 even. So the reaction to the video was twofold. There is one fold which basically claimed that it's a fabricated video by the Brotherhood. 
The second was claiming that it was a fabricated video, but by foreign governments, foreign enemies that are trying to tarnish the military. And since it is a foreign conspiracy, then the only approach is to crush it by brute force. The Egyptian government has an interest in maintaining its narrative of successfully fighting terror. Between 2011 and 2015, Cairo received $6.5 billion in US military aid. But at what cost? The Egyptian military has reported more than 6,000 deaths in northern Sinai since mid-2013. That figure greatly exceeds the number of militants in the area, no more than 1,000 according to the DC-based think tank, the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. The inability to verify what is really happening has created a void for the ISIS-affiliated Wilayat Sinai to fill with its own propaganda. Its latest release portrays its fighters as disciplined and methodical, patiently aiming and then firing at Egyptian soldiers who are made to appear panicked and vulnerable. When you are prohibiting and stopping access for journalists, reporters and researchers to investigate and report on what's happening there, you are creating a knowledge gap. And when you're doing that, this gap is also being filled with the terror group's propaganda. And it's very important that the Egyptian government realized that it's actually in the interest of the military that they actually allow independent researchers and journalists to have access to what's going on there. There was rare access granted to Egyptian journalists in April. The Department of Morale Affairs that manages the military's public image organized a press field day, taking journalists to see the aftermath of what was called a decisive victory. Critical voices, though, have been silenced. Ismail Skandarani, a prominent Sinai researcher and journalist, was arrested in December 2015 on charges of spreading false news and being a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. He has now been in jail without trial for a year and a half. Ismail Skandarani is the perfect example of how the regime is not tolerating any independent views. The reason that he caught the government's attention is that he was critical of the military's way of handling the insurgency. He was really a treasure of knowledge that could have been used by the government to actually devise a strategy that works, rather than use the hammer. You know, detaining journalists not only silences those individuals, but it silences the press, the media, uh, more generally, when they see this kind of uh, takedown of their colleagues on allegations such as, you know, spreading rumors, false news, this kind of thing, well, they tend to be very careful about what they say and very often don't say anything. The problem here is that it's not allowing for another independent voice that would humanize the people living in the region. There's just shadows on the wall. It doesn't matter if they die, it doesn't matter if they live. Nobody understands them and nobody wants to. And that's the real tragedy. It's hard to say exactly when some TV exec came up with the idea that sending a reporter out to report live on a hurricane in a hurricane somehow amounts to journalism. But it's become common practice in the U.S. and elsewhere. Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Jose have all recently featured hapless reporters fighting through howling gales, failing equipment, and wardrobe malfunctions. The key component in there is wardrobe, because it's not what the reporters say that matters, it's what they wear. Their jackets, their baseball caps, their microphones, all of them bear the network's logo for what is essentially an on-air exercise in marketing. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. This is as bad as it will get, right here, right? I can barely hear you. Play, so look at this. Some of the water now rolling down the walkway here. I don't need to state the obvious here, but we are officially in hurricane conditions. Let me venture out here a little bit. I'll show you what's coming down. Oh, good gosh. If you didn't believe the forecast, let me tell you, get inside. Do not stand here, class. I am having a hard time.
right, brother, do me a favor. Get to safety. Uh, the reporting's important. Your safety is essential. To this flooding story, here comes another gust. Out. Whoa. Can you see this, Dave? 